Welcome back. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Brendan Cole. The consecration of women as bishops is among the most divisive issues facing the world's 77 million Anglicans. Women already serve as bishops in Australia, New Zealand, Canada and the United States, but the Church of England, the mother church for the worldwide Anglican communion, has been mired in a dispute between reformers and traditionalists. Last week, the Church of England delayed a vote on allowing women bishops after reformers rejected a last-minute concession to conservatives. The Church's General Synod, or its Parliament, in other words, voted to send back to their bishops for further consideration an amendment allowing parishes to choose their male bishop as their leader if a woman is named to head their diocese. That put off a final vote on the draft legislation which most Church of England dioceses have already approved until the Church's next Synod in November. So, should women be allowed to don the mitre, or, as many opponents point out, would that break the chain of male authority that goes back 2,000 years to the dawn of Christianity? Well, to discuss this, I'm joined by Father Martin Neal. He's the vicar of Hawley Parish in Hampshire. Also here is Reverend Marjorie Brown, who's the vicar of St. Mary's Church in Primrose Hill. On the line, we have Alison Ralph, who's a lay member of the General Synod of the Church of England and one of the representatives of the Diocese of London. And also here in the studio is Reverend Canon Rosie Harper. She's the vicar of Great Missenden and chaplain to the Bishop of Buckingham. Well, thank you for joining me here on The Voice of Russia. I'm going to start with the news of last week's adjournment. Rosie Harper, what was your reaction? Well, I think we were faced with a set of almost impossible choices, and it's the least bad choice that could have been made. It seems to me that if we had gone directly to a vote... The nature of the way in which the bishops had changed the legislation would have meant that the women themselves were so unable to cope with it that the whole thing would have gone down and we would have been back in General Synod in about three or four years' time starting all over again. And this is despite the fact that the vast, overwhelming feeling in the country, 42 out of 44 dioceses, say, for heaven's sake, please get on with it. The vast majority of people were for it, Martin Neal, so it must have been disappointing for it to be adjourned in this way. I was disappointed it was adjourned, yes. I think it was a shame. I felt the church would have gone on and made the decision there and then. We don't need any more delay. Martin, I fully understand that. The, the, the really difficult thing was that the women had been put in a position where what their hearts really, really wanted, which was to have women bishops, had become impossible by the sudden tweaking of the legislation at the last minute by the House of Bishops. Alison Ruff, I'll turn to you. It's something that uh, the majority of Anglicans in the country wanted, and yet they've been, this has been delayed. That's right. Uh, according to the diocesan votes, it was 42 out of 44 dioceses. My diocese, London, uh, voted against it. Uh, actually, in the House of Clergy, it went down, which was interesting. But the, um, the problem is, as I see it, is that there has been so little teaching about women in authority uh, in the churches that people vote just as the world teaches them to vote, that in the secular society, uh, women are absolutely fine to be in authority over the men. Um, but that's not what I believe the Bible teaches. Um, and so I would, I would have voted uh, against this motion, this measure. And I take it back to Genesis, the very beginning of the Bible, when Adam was created by God first and Eve as his helper. Um, and therefore, uh, I see it in the Bible and in the church that Christ is the head of the church and the people are um, his body, uh, the bride. And um, that is reflected in marriage, the husband being the head of the household. And I believe that to be right. And I do not think it right in Scripture that men should be in authority over women. In the secular world, I have absolutely no problem with it. I think it's great. Marjorie Brown, what do you make of that? Well, I don't read the Bible in the same way as Alison. Uh, I would concur with her that in the Diocese of London, when the vote was taken, even the House of Laity in uh, London were in favour of this measure. So I think the... Uh, just. Uh, but I think the, the overwhelming view of the country is that uh, we must move on this. I certainly don't read the Bible in that, in that sort of... Um, what I would say a rather fundamentalist way of looking at uh, human nature. Um, I, I think we have to read the Bible in conjunction with our uh, tradition, our reason, our experience. And uh, what is very important to me is the theological reason for ordaining women, which is that if women are fully human, uh, then they can represent God. And if Christ didn't uh, take on all humanity in his incarnation, female as well as male uh, humanity, um, then you know we we shouldn't even be baptized, let alone ordained. So I think there's a 
very strong theological case for saying the church needs women as well as men at, at all levels of ministry and uh, in authority and teaching. That's a fair point, isn't mm. it, Martin Neal? I mean, as fully just... human as any man can be. That's not the issue for us. I don't think that uh, Catholics or evangelicals would ever claim that women are inferior Never, to absolutely. men. Uh, what we would say, perhaps, is that we are equal, but not exactly equivalent. But I want to pick up a bit of what Rosie said about her surprise or disappointment that the bishops brought back an amendment to the Synod. Um, they were invited to, after all, by the Synod itself. And although the votes in the dioceses were indeed 42 out of 44, 11 of those 44 dioceses did ask that greater provision be made. So a quarter of the dioceses did ask for further provision. It shouldn't be such a surprise that the bishop should listen to what a significant minority in the church actually asked them to do. I would like to thank the House of Bishops um, for the courage to actually do it. Uh, the little clause that's caused all the problem is called Clause 51C, um, and it was it was it really was fairly minor, but it absolutely infuriated the liberal wing of the Church of England and women who see that it is their right to be bishops. Why should they see that? I just don't understand that, unless it's pro uh, a career progression. And if it is, I think that's very sad. I think women could actually could be brilliant bishops. In fact, probably better than some of the men that we have or have had. But I just don't think it'd be right in Scripture. So, and I don't see why I should be kicked out of the Church of England as a loyal Anglican. And I've been an Anglican all my life. I've lived overseas and in, in a couple of countries, India and northern Canada. And every time I've come back, to, back home, I've rejoiced in belonging to the Church of England and being there. And it's, it's just a nightmare thought that I should be just pushed out of the Church of England. To be fair, you're not going to be pushed out of the church if this passes through. Well, that's exactly what through. will happen. Well, let, 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 let's look at the Unless basis of... Unless we get this proper provision brought through, as, as um, Martin Neal has said. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Brendan Cole. We're discussing women bishops in England. With me in the studio was Father Martin Neal, the vicar of Hawley Parish in Hampshire. Also in the studio, Reverend Canon Rosie Harper, Vicar of Great Missenden and Chaplain to the Bishop of Buckingham, and Reverend Marjorie Brown, the Vicar of St Mary's Church in Primrose Hill, London. On the line we have Alison Roof, lay member of the General Synod of the Church of England and one of the representatives of the Diocese of London. Okay, but the, ba the basis of your belief, you, you mentioned it was, uh, it, was, it was enshrined in Scripture, and I think, I think when you... Were... Well, that's how I understand it and how I've always been taught. But also in Romans, Paul praises women as being very active in the early church, and, and I suppose you could argue that uh, the Bible does state that the resurrection was witnessed by women rather than men, even if, um, even if the, none of the apostles were men. I mean, is, is it really as strictly as black and white as that? For me, it is, absolutely, and for all conservative evangelicals. There's no question of it. And where the growth is in the church are, is in particular evangelical <laughs> churches. Alison, you, you really are making some very sweeping statements here. I'd first of all like to just simply state that I think you describing this whole issue as greedy women wanting promotion is really I didn't insulting. Say they were greedy. I didn't say You'll that. You say that after, after promotion, and, and I just don't think that's the case. Also, I think that it, you're implying that we don't take the gospel seriously. And in fact, for no, me, the reason, the reason I'm arguing this is that it is a really, really important gospel imperative. If we want to speak in our generation about justice and about freedom, then we have to get justice and freedom sorted within our own institution. Why? Because why, people why, don't... Why do you equate this with justice and freedom? The Bible and Christianity... Um, is the most wonderful form of freedom and justice you could possibly have. It served us for 2,000 well, years. Well, no, actually, Alison, it hasn't. Of we've, had it has. to, we've had to work our way towards it, and these truths have gradually become In revealed. In the last 20, 30 years. It took a long time before Christians realised that slavery wasn't right. We had to work our way towards it, and that was an issue of justice and freedom. It took a long time before Christians stopped being against abolishing the death penalty, and that was an issue of justice and freedom. There's another point I'd like to move on to, and um, I'll I'll turn to you, Martin Neal. You were quoted as saying that uh, you have to be absolutely certain that the person who celebrates a sacrament is either a priest or a bishop, and you refer to the sacramental assurance. Can you explain what sacramental assurance yes, is? Yes, indeed. Sacramental assurance has been with the church from the very beginning. The church has always wanted to celebrate the sacraments, and here particularly I'm talking about um, the ordination and also the Holy Communion. It's very clear that the church is ordered, and the Church of England is part of that ordered a church society which says that the sacraments need to be conveyed through the appropriate minister. My difficulty 
with the idea of women bishops as it was with women priests is that I'm not entirely sure that the General Synod, being a, a local gathering of Christians in a very small part of the church, has actually the authority to change the nature of what we might call the Catholic ministry so that it can develop it unilaterally. It doesn't own the Catholic ministry. It says it is part of it, but it hasn't owned the whole thing. So I don't see it actually as authority to do it. But Synod thinks it has. However, the church did say that there was always a place in it for those of us who were loyal Anglicans who couldn't in conscience accept the ordination of women as priests or as bishops. And it had to give expression to that. Now, sacramental assurance is really an argument that we need to be sure that those who celebrate the sacraments are those ordered. It's a very fearful position to, to think that God somehow withholds grace in the sacraments because the wrong person is being yeah. ordained. I found extraordinary uh, fearfulness. Uh, but the other thing that is deeply offensive to women is that uh, the present uh, amended measure as proposed at General Synod didn't simply offer people who were in all conscience opposed the right to have a male bishop, but to have a male bishop who shared their view, which might mean a male bishop who had ordained a woman would therefore be invalidated in their eyes. And that's an extraordinary thing to say. So what makes them invalid? I mean, why, why would, why would somebody believe them? It doesn't make them invalid at all. It's not because of in being invalid. I'm dubious as to whether these women who are ordained priest or bishop are priest or bishop. Don't say they're not. But to be sure, you have to be able to see that these people who are priests and bishops have been ordained according to Catholic order. Yes, I'm not fearful in the slightest. I'm but, the least fearful but, person but around. But why would a male bishop who has ordained a woman be unacceptable to you, Martin? I didn't say there would be. But the measure allows you to refuse such a person. It, it, it may well indeed. But I'm that not was asked for. Indeed. I think what that proposal, Clause 5.1c, did was allow sufficient room for those of us who in conscience cannot accept the ordination of women as priests and bishops to remain within the Church of England. I think less than that will be excluding, and that will be a great pity because it will reduce the breadth of the Church of England. I'm not saying that bishops who ordain women as bishops aren't bishops. But, but I'm saying that's not sacramental assurance. What it says is that we cannot be sure that the women they consecrate as bishops are bishops and therefore the priests and bishops that those women bishops I, und I, understand, I understand the point, but the, the amended measure that was, decided, was deferred would have allowed people to choose a bishop who was in accordance with their thinking, which might mean choose a bishop who had never ordained a woman, which is an extraordinary thing well, to put it, into the law of the land. But it has to be down the line, because once you allow women to be bishops, as Synod wants to, mm. and our half of me says get on with it if you really want to do it, once you allow that, further down the line, mm. all priests... Yes. who will then be ordained bishop, will have but been ordained by someone okay. who has been a woman bishop <laughs> Look, I, I just, I, I just, I like to turn to Rosie Harper, uh, chaplain to the Bishop of Buckingham here. I guess the problem here is that the argument about the validity of uh, ordination and whether a woman will be considered valid, if it becomes a two-tier system, the, the, the congregation won't consider them as, as to be good as male priests. Well, I mean, there's no doubt at all that the most... Um, beneficial thing for the whole church would be simply to decide, yes, we're going to have women bishops, they'll be on a completely equal basis with male bishops. It would be completely comprehensible to the country. My kids don't get it at all mm -hmm. that there's a possibility that a man and a woman can have equal gifts from God, an equal sense of calling, and yet because of her ovaries, the woman can't actually have the same job as the man. They just don't see it. It's, it's beyond their comprehension. That's because you're seeing terms in terms of a job, a secular employment. No, no, no. I'm this is actually a sacramental about, gift from it's about God. Representing God and a man and a woman can both represent God. And it says God. so in Genesis. He yeah. looked and he needed to have both male and female before he felt that it was exactly. made in his own image. Exactly. Yes, but the woman was made as, as the helper. Um, and, and that doesn't give her authority over the man. And, you know, in this country, in the last uh, two or three decades at least, we've emasculated the role of men by, by, by women um, because women have gone into every single sphere of society. Oh, and men not have the men I been, know. <laughs> men have just been pushed back. And in marriage, it's greatly... Uh, reflected in the way that uh, men do not really act as head of the household anymore in so many marriages. And that is incredibly sad. And 
uh, and we shouldn't let that happen. The men need to get their act together and actually make those right decisions as head of the household, head of the family. I'll turn to you, uh, Marjorie Brown. <laughs> since since uh, there have been women vicars since 1994, there's been something like more than 2,000. Yes. What impact have women had on the Anglican Church? I think it's had an, an enormous impact on women uh, clergy. I, I've certainly found in my own pastoral ministry that women have been challenged by seeing a woman at the altar to see themselves in a new light, um, to, to see that God may be calling them to something they hadn't imagined, that they can reflect God in their daily lives. It's been hugely liberating for women to to feel that they're included. Uh, and, and I think in a, you know, we can't make generalizations about how men and women operate, but I think there is a sense in which women are used to collaborating. We're socialized from an early age to collaborate, to work together. So we uh, women vicars often make very good team leaders, very good facilitators and encouragers of congregations. And uh, research has shown that the kind of church that grows is the church that has a woman vicar. There's actually a statistical evidence that, uh, that they are better I'd at like growing to churches. That's simply not true. No, no, not true at all. The church has continued its decline, even having an influx of women priests. And I don't think the women priests have made a jot of difference to the attendance or to the faith of the church. Well, my church has grown. Has yours? So my church has grown. My church has grown as well. (laughs) Let's rejoice. Let's rejoice that all these churches. Exactly. So you can't claim that the the church is growing because you're women priests. But Alison Roof, for almost two decades, there have been women priests. This refusal to allow uh, women and bishops, it's a bit like shutting the stable door after the horse has bolted. It's too late. I mean, women are accepted into the church and to, to administer sacraments and to, to, to run congregations. Becoming a bishop is surely the next step. Well, that's how women in the church see it. Uh, it's certainly not how I see it, or people uh, who are conservative evangelicals, and also the Anglo-Catholic uh, a grouping in, in General Synod, or in the Church of England. And, you know, we had the Act of Synod, which was to give people uh, proper provision and make sure that um, people were cared for who couldn't uh, uh, accept female min- um, um, females in the ministry. And now we've just got a lot of broken promises. And so if we go down this route of having this, what um, both um, I think um, Marjorie and Rosie would talk about is a one-clause measure that we either have female bishops or we don't, and that's it then um, who's going to look after those of us who simply cannot accept women bishops? We must have some sort of proper provision to take care of us. This is The Voice of Russia. We're discussing female bishops in England. Discussing this is Martin Neal, Rosie Harper, Marjorie Brown and Alison Roof. Rosie Harper, it's unsurprising that there's this debate, but it took 17 years, I think, for the agreement on women priests. No, it is, long, it is, is surprising, it? but the history of the whole church is that revelation is an ongoing process. Right from the very beginning in the New Testament, they thought they'd got it sussed, and then God had to speak to them and say, no, actually, for example, you do not have to be circumcised to be a proper Christian. You do not have to eat certain types of food to be a proper Christian. Gradually, gradually, the truth becomes unfold, uh, unfolds appropriate to each generation and it's always incremental it's i think it's the british way if you think of the way in which we got universal suffrage eventually they thought well yeah maybe we'll include women but they said only women who are 30 and have got some property and then we had to revisit it a few years later so i'm absolutely you sure we'll get that there in the, the bible end. teaching well of course that- i can i'm talking about justice and equality oh, exactly these, these, are, these are catchphrases. You, all, you can all come up with those, and we, we have got to have some content to them. But I, I'm always amused at the argument that the Church of England is uniquely blessed with this revelation. Yeah. It's very interesting that God only speaks through the Church of England, oh, and the yeah. rest and of the, the Church Lutherans will follow in due course. Yes, and, and the whole wider Anglican communion, there are millions of Christians around the world who accept women in ministry equally with men. Well, interesting enough, the Church of Wales didn't go for women bishops. They voted against it. So maybe the Church of England will do so in its wisdom too. But Marjorie Brown, is it, uh, how is this viewed in um, Anglican communions uh, across the world? We make far too much of our position in the world, to be honest. I think Anglicans and other parts <laughs> of the world have, have moved on and don't, don't really take that much notice of what we do in England. I mean, in the, church, in the American church, this is a non-issue. Uh, Anglo-Catholics uh, in the American Episcopal Church uh, accept women without any question whatsoever, apart from a very, very few small pockets of, of opposition, it's by and large just not an issue. But the whole of the church in the United States has been wrecked by, by um, liberalism, um, by women bishops, by practicing homosexuals, and there's a massive split in the church uh, in America, and the churches are having a very tough time where they've stood up for gospel truth because 
they're losing their property, their churches, by, by the Liberal wing. And Alice, I really appalling. don't think we can let you get away with making those sweeping and rather well, it's homophobic absolutely and true sexist that it's comments. It's quite appalling what's going on in the States. I think it's certainly true that there's a... It's a, not, all a yeah. fa- not all the fault of women, I do admit. There's a big divide, surely, in the Anglican Communion between the, the white colonial churches and the churches of the third world. It's very easy for us to speak about New Zealand, Australia, the United States, as though that were really the whole of the Anglican Communion. Exactly. There are many more provinces out there. This is not a dead issue in those other provinces. But, Martin Neal, do you see some kind of exodus if this does go through in November? I was one of those who was very disturbed by the Synod's vote back in 1992, but I took Synod's promises at their face value. What I don't want is for Synod to take away all the promises that were made yeah. then, and I don't want perpetuity, as it was then called, to last only 20 years, as it might well at this stage. We want provision which will allow Anglicans to remain in the Church of England loyally members of the Church of England. And indeed, Martin, that's exactly what we want too. That's Absolutely. why there's a very strong code of practice. And there's not the least but the code hint. of practice is only a code of practice. And it's not um, enforceable in law except by judicial review. But what do you that's imagine right. might happen, Martin, that a woman bishop would storm into your church and take you by force? You mean as, as they have in America? <laughs> well, they have in America, of course, as you well know if you read, no. read your recent history. No, I think the thing is that if, if you really want evangelicals and Catholics to stay in the Church of England, then we must have what we need, not simply what might be grudgingly offered, which will not be enough. Uh, Alison Roth, in this interim period until November when the Synod votes again, what will uh, opponents be using this time for? What will you be looking for in the next six months? I don't know. It's, it's what we would say is between a rock and a hard place. And I think what we do have to do, every single Christian, is to pray for wisdom for the House of Bishops. I think they fully understand that proper provision must be made, and it is not good enough just to have a code of practice, which at the moment we just have as a draft, and we don't really know what it will contain. And, and, at the, and, and as Martin says, that's not enshrined in church law, in the canon. So we have to do something that makes some sort of degree of sense of protection. Otherwise, uh, if it goes through um, and, and without proper protection, the Church of England will be damaged and split and divided and never be the same again. I'll turn to Marjorie Brown. I mean, what do you make of that? It's very difficult to explain to people outside the church what we're on about at all. And I think the word protection is such a giveaway. Yes. The idea that, we, that the church somehow has to be protected from the ministry of its women in clergy is, is something so offensive, frankly, <laughs> and, and uh, deeply disturbing. And there's no evidence that, that women, uh, you know, provide, contaminate or harm people. Uh, I just find this extraordinary. That, I mean, the, the provision will go through with a robust code of practice, which everybody has agreed is, is going to be done. And it's allow some room for grace, for people living together in love and caring for one another, rather than saying we must go to law, which St. Paul obviously warned Christians about, uh, to protect ourselves from one another. I find that such a dead end and such a poor witness to the world. Plenty of women do not agree with the donation of women. It's not right to claim that all women are fall on one side of this argument by any means. It's not a gender argument. Most people, men and women, want women bishops in the Church of England. Most women and most men couldn't really be bothered. They've got other things to worry about in their life. But and they and do also, I come back to the point, we have the church, churches, the clergy have failed massively, in my opinion, of not teaching about the issues. So what happens, people just pick up what's going on in the world and a secular view is then imposed upon the church. That will not do. We are now at a state, actually, the exact opposite, Alison. We're at a state where the secular view has got higher ethical standards than what's going on inside the church. And not only is it important for women within this country, but, I'm but a it's, woman it's, too. Important, it's important yes. for women around the world because women around the world are being treated incredibly badly by men who them... claim their headship over their women. Mm. And while we want to talk about how bad that is, and within our own church, we but still have this right level of discrimination. We have no right to have a voice in those situations. It's that, that does, that's nothing to do with having women bishops. I, I would agree with you 100% on all you've said, that we, we, we must look after women and protect them. But it doesn't give us in the church the authority to, to change things after 2,000 years and, and what, is, what is a, a few decades 
just a, a twinkling in, 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 in God's eye, as it were, in terms of what, what about the What about the legal standpoint? I mean, if the, if the Synod does agree, um, will it be I think legally moment, robust enough to get through Britain's Parliament? So I'm turning well, to Rosie Well, that's a Harper really interesting question. With the Code of Practice, I think it would be, because that would be an internal agreement. And people are speaking too lightly of the Code of Practice. That is a very strong, clear promise. And there is no single but woman... But broken over the Act of Synod. You can't say that. There is that's no why people are so annoyed. There is no single woman who would dream of going into a situation and forcing herself upon someone who didn't want her. But once you put it into the law of the land, Parliament will recognise that the Church is trying to enshrine something of a lower ethical standard than the law of our country. And it's quite likely, we heard it at Synod the other day, that Parliament wouldn't wear it. Yes, and it was just bully boy tactics from the Second Estates Commissioner who is a member of the Ecclesiastical Committee, and it was absolutely appalling to oh, hear him Oh, you mean it was say, a man being strong, Alison? No, it Surely wasn't. Surely he was it exerting was his leadership. <laughs> and there was, uh, it was appalling the way he behaved, um, and, and just sort of said, well, if you do this, we're not going to vote, vote it through in the Ecclesiastical Committee. That's outrageous behaviour. No, it isn't. It's actually being ethical being and congruent to what the atmosphere in the country is. Mm. I'd just like to finish, actually. Um, Rowan Williams, Archbishop of Canterbury, um, said that an, adjour- an, an adjournment would at least give the chance of lowering the temperature. The temperature is quite <laughs> hot in here, but um, uh, Marjorie Brown, the, this adjournment will actually give people more time to reflect, won't it? And because because this has to be absolutely perfect when it goes through, well, doesn't it? I wish I wish we could have perfect legislation. I doubt very much that we'll ever get there. Um, but I think it, I, I did feel a huge sense of relief that we were, a, you know, this adjournment was granted because I think we do need to pray and look after one another and listen to one another very carefully and make sure we go forward in a way that the next generation will thank us for rather than, than you know, regretting that very poor legislation was put through. So it's really important. But what is really the bottom line is the fact that everybody who wishes women bishops are just hoping that the House of Bishops will capitulate and and give in to to their request. And my prayer is that that the House of Bishops will be brave, either come back with what they've already decided or have a very little change to what they've said. We must have proper provisions for Anglo-Catholic people and clergy and conservative evangelicals. And I'm confident that, that can happen, happen Martin Neal. I'm confident that will happen. Let me make a prediction. When Synod meets next in November, the House of Bishops will have agreed a different clause. <laughs> it will say the same thing in different words. Mm. And that will be enough for those who think that we must have some provision, but not too much, and those of us who think we must have some provision, but enough, to agree. Will you then and vote I look for forward it, to Martin? it going through. I'm not on the synod. I won't vote for it, no. <laughs> and uh, just so, a final... Uh, hang on a minute, Alison, if you wouldn't Rosie vote Harper. for it, why does it matter to you that any changes are made or not made? Because You're not going to vote for it anyway. I'm not going to vote for it, but I, didn't, I, I do want to make sure that there is proper provision. Um, so are you it, assuming that you'll lose the vote then? I think, the, I think it's still possible that it'll go down in the House of Laity. I think the House of Clergy will pass it. The House of Bishops is divided, but I think there's a very, very strong likelihood that it'll fail in the House of Laity. Rosie Harper, I'd just like to quickly add, um, by, the t- by, t- by the time November rolls around, this could be quite... Uh, I mean, would it be a bit of a Pyrrhic victory because we've, we've, you would have had splintering, splintering opinions and quite a lot of resentment after this debate? I mean, will it, what, how, would, how would the Church move on after that vote? I think what needs to happen is we need to have some real embodied women in the House of Bishops where it can gradually become normalised. I think all women are embodied. (laughs) It's a silly thing to say. No, you need... need, Women are embodied. You need women bishops, real ones, not notional ones, in amongst the mix, beginning to have discussions about how we can move forward and beginning to normalise it. And until that happens, almost irrespective of the sort of uh, legislation that we have, we're going to get stuck. I think we're just going to have to leave it there. We could be be debating this all day, in fact. But uh, I'd like to thank uh, all my guests, (laughs) Father Martin Neal, the vicar of Hawley Parish in Hampshire, uh, Reverend Canon Rosie Harper, vicar of Great Missenden, chaplain to the Bishop of Buckingham, Reverend Marjorie Brown from uh, St Mary's Church in Primrose Hill, London, and on the line, Mrs. Alison Roof, who's the lay member of the General Synod of the Church of England and one of the representatives of the Diocese of London. Thank you very much to all my guests for joining me here on The Voice of Russia.